All right, now, it's important to have a pre-planned algorithm, okay? All right. Okay, I got one. Okay, good. Okay, now, be willing to act quickly. Use the fiber optic video if you have to, just use it. Good, good. Now have a low threshold to asking a specialist for assistance, okay? Wait. Aren't these the guidelines for trauma airway management? Well, yeah, they are, but they work for burgers too. Come on. Dr. Bright. Rob, what's up? Imagine, okay, we were in the midst of fisticuffs. Fisticuffs, yeah, happens to me every day. And I punched you in the tracheobronchial tree. That's hard to imagine. Oh! oh. Just imagine. Okay. <laughs> and now you've got an airway problem. Yeah. How would you manage that? That's a good question. Can we learn something about it? Next article. Paul John. Trauma this is a management. really cool review article with a lot of useful clinical pearls. We'll talk about it. Uh, the first thing you want to do is figure out what are the indications for emergency intubation for a patient who has a, uh, a trauma patient who needs to have their airway definitively um, taken care of. And the questions you have to ask yourself is, is there a failure to maintain or protect the airway, number one? Number two is, is there a failure to oxygen or ventilate? And number three, is there a need for intubation? based on the anticipated clinical course. And whenever you're testing for airway protection, the things you wanna be doing is evaluating their phonation, the patient's phonation. Are they able to swallow normally, handle secretions normally? What you don't wanna do, especially in a trauma patient who's in a C collar, laying flat, they're critically ill, is gagging them with a tongue depressor because gagging them smart. only makes things worse, especially Ooh. if they vomit and aspirate. And in addition, there's a normal weak gag reflex in up to one in four normal healthy adults. So it's not a really useful tool. There's more harm than benefits. Which one? So which, one which one? Which are you? I've got a. I've got a hyper acute gag reflex. Do you? I'm. I'm. Oh. I'm. I'm mid range. Mid range. <laughs> Mine is actually pretty weak. So mm -hmm. hey, that there you go. There, there, there's the spectrum of, three. of society. And the second question is oxygenation versus ventilation evaluation. Of course, you're going to be looking at the monitor, looking at the oxygen saturation, the respiratory rate. If you have entile CO2 monitoring, those will be metrics to clue you in on what their clinical course is going to be like. And in that vein, what is their anticipated clinical course? Are they going to be parked outside radiology waiting in a hallway with no one around? Because it'll be too late by the time they decompensate. So you should err on the side of taking over definitively that airway before you send them off to the tunnel of death. That never happens. And whenever you want to assess for a difficult airway, there are lots of mnemonics. The two popular ones mentioned in this article are lemon and moans. Um, but the biggest thing as far as algorithm goes, the, the most important critical step in the difficult trauma airway algorithm is if you have time, call for help. Call the anesthesiologist. Call your surgical colleagues because they not only have experience, but also they have access to equipment you might not have. And so they can start arranging the operating room. They can bring down a flex, uh, flexible laryng laryngoscope and help you uh, to intubate them. If you don't have time, it's very imminent. You have to know it's one best attempt. You get one try, optimize that with the most senior person, most experienced person. And if you don't, then you have to be prepared to do a surgical airway. And to be honest, the one of the biggest take-home points from all this article is don't underestimate the value of awake laryngoscopy. And the idea is, is that the patient can follow commands, and, they, and you can answer the question, is oral intubation even possible? Can you see the cords? Uh, can you even intubate this patient? And you can see here, this was from Essentials of Emergency Medicine a couple of years ago when we did a live demonstration of awake laryngoscopy. This is a gem. It's a tool that is underutilized a lot in a critically ill trauma patient that you don't want to paralyze. And it gives you lots of information. Now, in the specific setting of head trauma, the, if you are gonna pursue RSI, there is some pretreatment things that you can consider to decrease intracranial pressure, especially with laryngeal manipulation, lidocaine and fentanyl. In the cases of frank shock uh, in the trauma patient, there is uh, one recommendation that they make in this paper, which is reducing the atominate dose, typically at 0.3 mg per kg. In this case, they're saying that in frank shock, consider using half dose atominate at 0.15 mg per kg. And honestly, it was a head scratcher for me. I have heard it from uh, anesthesia colleagues in the past, but I never actually dug into the literature. And when you actually look at the article citations, there's no actual clinical studies and good studies that show that half dose atominate has any significant uh, clinical effects relative to regular 0.3 uh, mix per kg contaminate. 
That being said, all the cited references look at high dose atomic. You're talking two to three times the normal dose, 0 0.45, 0 0.7, one mg per kg. And yeah, higher dose atomic does lead to uh, decrease in your MAP, your mean arterial pressures. But half dose atomic, a little unclear, but they do say reduce, uh, consider reducing the atomic to half dose. With ketamine also, they say instead of using the typical 1.5 mg per gig as an induction agent, if you have a hemodynamically unstable patient, start with a lower dose at 1 mg per gig because high doses of ketamine can also cause you to uh, bottom out your pressures. For the polytrauma patient who's complicated or critically ill, as far as choice of paralytics go, succinylcholine is going to be king. That's what they recommend. Fast on, fast off compared to rocuronium. That debate is ongoing, but rocuronium does last 45 minutes. And if you need to evaluate the patient, see where they're going, succinylcholine is going to be a recommendation. Interesting in this paper that they did say that definitively that succinylcholine is a choice, but it is such a controversial issue. It sure is. Yeah. I, I don't know that, that you could say it you know, so that, yep, sucks is it, that's it. Here's why. I mean, they give good reasons why, but for, far from a resolved uh, Ooh, question yeah. or issue. It's, it doesn't settle the debate, but that is what they say in the paper. And now, specifically with regard to tracheal bronchial injury that you're suspecting, uh, the biggest take-home point is if you suspect tracheal bronchial injury, the last thing you ever want to do in the emergency department is converting a partial transection into a complete transection. And so the take-home point being if you suspect tracheal bronchial injury with a clinical course you anticipate will require definitive airway, call the OR, call your surgical colleagues because they need to do that in the OR under very controlled settings. And um, if you have an imminent airway that you have to take care of down in the emergency department, the best chance you'll have is going to be with an awake fiber optic intubation with a 6-0 ET tube and be prepared concurrently um, calling your surgical colleagues to take them to the OR. Cricothyroidotomies generally are not going to be successful in these cases because the laryngeal transection or injury is going to be distal to where you're going to be performing the cricothyroidotomy. So that's something to be aware of in the back of your head. Scared. You don't want a bloody mess inside Scared. your ED. So take home points, awake laryngoscopy is going to be your friend. Uh, polytrauma patient, the RSI paralytic of choice, they recommend succinylcholine. Frank Schock, uh, a trauma patient, for induction agent, use half dose atominate at 0 0.15 mg per kg. And kind of the recommendation for a shock patient in general would be yeah. that yeah. half dose of an induction agent. Are you ready for some questions, Dr. Mark? I am so ready. You've got a trauma, polytrauma patient, got hit it. in the head, yep. hit, hit everywhere, Burp. not doing so well. Bleep. You need to do an RSI. Blurb. According to this article, what is your paralytic of Blubus. choice? Uh, according to this article, you just said it, there's a little controversy. Probably succinylcholine, fast on, fast off, fast off, quote unquote. Sometimes fast ain't fast enough, but for this one, let's go with succinylcholine. <laughs> Correct. All right. You have a guy who has jumped out of a three-story balcony. He's drunk. He's hypotensive. He's got shock. He is shockity shock, shock, shock. You want to give him some atomidate? What's your dose? Your normal dose, there in B at point three, right? Then you got a bunch of high doses. It's a trap. It's a trap. It's a trap. It's a trap. A half dose, at least again here, although, you know, we'll see what the, in the real world, they may be different, but here, 0.15, they're saying is okay, and they say go for Survey it. Survey says, correct answer. Very nice. That Very nice. I tip my conquistador hat to you. And I oh. tip my whatever this one is. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much.